Okay, so let's take, let, to, we're going to look at this text by Immanuel Kant, the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals. I've posted the entire text online for your review. Uh, it's a short text, although it's a very dense and in no way easy text to read, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, however, the parts of the text that are going to be most of interest to us are parts, the preface and parts one and part two. And as you'll see uh, in the presentation or in the, the excerpts that I provided for you here, uh, part three we're going to largely elide uh, in large measure because the effort or the, the, the function of part three, at least as I read it, is more philosophical than it is political. There is a political or political philosophical implication that's a very important in part three, but the way that Kant works it out, to my eyes at least, reads much more uh, in conjunction with or cons consistent with the efforts that he then picks up in books like The Critique of Practical Reason and so on. Uh, so we're going to focus largely on the preface and then parts one and parts two. And I'll have a few brief comments to make about uh, what he says in part three at the, very, uh, end of our, at the very end of our discussion. So this is one of the two texts that we're reading by Kant. We have the two Kants, as it were, represented in our text. We have Kant, the philosopher, this writer of almost unreadable German, who over the course of about a decade produced uh, epic, dense texts that even his contemporaries found extremely difficult to get through, uh, which have plagued philosophy students ever since. And then we have the Kant of who I would call journalism or polemic. Uh, this is the Kant who wrote What is Enlightenment, the Kant who wrote The Perpetual Peace. And so uh, you, have, you have each of those to consider. And of course, the, the difference in the text also is, maps onto a kind of difference in the kinds of speculations that it invites us to make based on what he is, on what he is saying. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to briefly situate the text inside of its time and place. Uh, my intention is not to give you a biography of, of Immanuel Kant. Wikipedia can do that perfectly, perfectly fine. But it, I will uh, briefly contextualize the text and where I think this text is coming from. And then I'm going to walk through with you uh, some of the key sections that I think help explain a little bit this, uh, this project that Kant wants us to, to think about. There is a lot inside of this text which strikes the modern reader, and in fact I think readers from almost the time in, from which it was published, as being very counterintuitive, in part because if we follow the logic uh, that Kant sets out in this text, it leads to some conclusions that seem extremely incommodious and in fact outright immoral, which obviates then the seeming purpose of the text, which is to talk to us about a kind of absolute moral foundation to human society or to human beings themselves. Uh, so part of the challenge we'll have is to try and work out if there's a way to resolve these seeming paradox, and I'll explain a little bit what those paradoxes are uh, in just a moment. So to briefly situate the text, there is what I'm calling Kant's decennium mirabile, his marvelous decade in which he produced uh, those works for which he is primarily well known. The only one that's really missing from here in terms of his greatest hits is the so-called third critique, the critique of, of, uh, of judgment. But we'll see that he starts the decade in 1781 with his epic text, The Critique of Pure Reason. Uh, and then he follows it up with these, uh, with these two, the, the short text, What is Enlightenment, which we've already briefly considered in this class uh, when we looked at Wollstonecraft, and then the text that we're going to look at today, The Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, and you'll see at the end of the decade, he follows up from the Critique of Pure Reason, which he revises in 1787, which is often called the B version of that text. He follows it up with the Critique of Practical Reason, and both of those texts, the Critique of Pure and Practical Reason, come out of some of the challenges that he lays out here in this book, The Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. It's a curiosity that Whereas at the end of his life, Kant did actually produce a book entitled The Metaphysics of Morals. The real follow-up to this text, since this is just the groundwork that we're looking at, is not that Metaphysics of Morals text from the early uh, 1800s, but instead this, uh, these two critiques of pure and practical reason. However, those texts belong to a philosophy class, and we're in a political philosophy class, so uh, you should be as grateful as I am that we don't have to consider what they say because they're very, very difficult indeed to get through. So we're going to be looking instead at this text, The Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. And of course, the question is, why? first of all, why did Kant write it? And also, why is it only a groundwork? The, note, the word in German that he uses is Grundlage, so preparing the foundations, as it were, of a proper treatment of the metaphysics of morals. Or 
we might put it this way, preparing the ground or preparing the terrain for thinking about morality as an abstraction was the sort of Kantian project that he wanted to engage in. And in this 1785 text, he only gives us what he thinks of as a kind of preliminary exercise towards that uh, larger goal of thinking about a kind of absolute morality in the abstract. So let's consider then the intellectual milieu from which this text uh, arrives. Obviously, the larger background is the Enlightenment, what the Germans called Aufklärung. Uh, so Kant is absolutely an Enlightenment figure. As we've already seen in this class, one of the main protagonists of the Enlightenment is the notion of human reason, using human reason in a bold and different way. Many of you wrote your essays on Mary Wollstonecraft, and so you've already observed how central the notion of human reason is to her text, to her argument, to her idea of identity. So that's a very typical kind of uh, Enlightenment uh, principle. And we further saw, in setting up that Wollstonecraft text, we turned our attention directly to Kant, his text on what is Enlightenment, and we saw Kant, perhaps better than anyone, lay out the notion of reason in its enlightenment form, namely this idea that reason was still in its infancy, that we human beings have not yet learned to use or leverage our reason effectively, that we are still awaiting a moment in which we will become more mature in terms of the use of our reason. And then the second critical component for Kant was that reason is not a private activity, but a public activity, the so-called public use of reason being fundamental then to this project to help advance humanity along the text, What is Enlightenment, being a prime example of that public use of reason, helping people understand the world around them. And in a way, this text on the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals is consistent with that Kantian agenda, that Kantian imperative for how we should use our reason. In this case, we see it being applied to the question of, is there such a thing as a true morality? Uh, and the idea would be that you would be able to read Kant's text and it would change your outlook on life. So it's very consistent with that kind of larger enlightenment intellectual agenda that we've already encountered in this class. But there are two more proximate uh, figures who I think are fundamental to explaining uh, this Kantian effort. Uh, the more obvious one, the one whom you frequently encounter when you, you turn your attention to Kant's work, is the thought of David Hume who's pictured uh, above looking uh, rather in good point and self-satisfied. David Hume it figures largely in the work of Immanuel Kant in part because Kant himself went out of his way to credit Hume for having what he called awoken him from intellectual slumber, as if to say that Kant had, until he read Hume, not fully realized all the things that he wanted to think about. And once he read Hume, he read Hume both enthusiastically, excitedly, but also as a challenge. He wanted to, as it were, rescue the project of knowledge from the corner into which it had been driven by, uh, by David Hume, uh, particularly in Hume's famous work, The Treatise on Human Nature. So let me briefly dwell on, very briefly, about David Hume. He was a, uh, the preeminent figure of what we call the Scottish Enlightenment. You probably know the name Adam Smith, another figure of the Scottish uh, Enlightenment. David Hume belonged to a class of philosophers known collectively as the empiricists, the father of philosophical empiricism, another figure that we've encountered in this class, no less than John Locke, whose enormous essay, an essay concerning human understanding, is often seen as the sort of beginnings of uh, this movement called uh, empiricism. And the founding idea of empiricism, as laid out by Locke and then developed uh, thereafter by important figures like George Barclay and finally David Hume, was that the human, human knowledge, the human being, is driven by our senses, by our relationship and interaction with the sensible world. Uh, Locke himself famously described the human, the human being as what he called a tabla rasa, an empty slate upon which knowledge, things were written based on our acquisition of experience all of which was then mediated by our senses. So another way of thinking about that is that we are born into this world without any kind of innate or preconceived uh, elements to us, right? That, that everything we are is then defined by the environment that is around us. This is powerful, uh, a powerful uh, position because it suggests sort of uh, in sympathetic lines with what we've already seen intimated at in Hobbes, uh, 
that everything that is there for Aratus is contingent. There is nothing absolute. It can all be changed. It's all a function of convention or their thing. There's no, as it were, abstract idea of what power is or what honor is or what nobility is or anything like that. All of this is actually created out of, the, uh, out of our interaction with the world. So this was the kind of uh, idea of, uh, of empiricism that we see laid out in, essay, in the essay Concerning Human Understanding by Locke. And David Hume picked up on this idea, and then in his essay on concerning human nature, he took that and raised the kind of basic question that, that it sort of suggests, which is, is there a way for us to know anything absolutely, right? If we are uh, simply, if the knowledge we have is created out of the experiences that, that we have with the world, is the notion of absolute knowledge of something possible? Um, and so he investigated this in such a way as to come to the conclusion that the answer is no which is why we sometimes call Hume the kind of radical empiricist or a radical skeptic in this, uh, in this regard. He said that the human brain, that the human psyche, is incapable of uh, accessing absolute knowledge by, the, by virtue of the interaction that we have with the world and how we then process where knowledge come from, comes from. He points out, for example, that we think, we tend to think in terms of cause and effect. He says we see the sun get up in the morning and therefore we associate the day with the sun rising. And so we create a cause effect. The day is caused by the rising of the sun. But can we know that with absolute certainty? Is there some deeper truth that we can access? And the answer is no, because the only knowledge we have that day is caused by the rising of the sun is the fact that it happens over and over and over and over and over again. But who knows, the millionth time, the 10 millionth time, a billion years from now, will that in fact be the case? And the answer is we can't know because our knowledge is itself entirely bounded by the empirical world in which we inhabit. So we have the illusion of knowledge. We have the illusion of truth. And we can use that illusion of truth often quite handily. We know, for example, that if we jump in a pool, we will get wet. Even though we can't know it with certainty, the rule will, will work well enough for us to therefore not want to jump into a pool fully clothed. But the point for Hume is it means that there's no such thing as absolute certainty, right? That a, a, the idea of a categorical or absolute knowledge simply is beyond what human beings can, uh, can master. Instead, the truth that we operate by is entirely driven by this world of perception. So when I jump into the pool without my clothes on because I know I'm going to get wet, it's not because I have an absolute truth about the nature of water and what it does to people. It's because my perception has given me the truth that I can then operationalize in my own life. So for Kant, this was problematic because it suggests there is no absolute. There's no such thing as absolute knowledge of any kind. Therefore, any kind of scheme that wants to be premised or built on uh, absolute foundations is fundamentally uh, impossible. You'll see then, that the Humean skeptical argument, Humean skepticism, is, among other things, a challenge to what we might call traditional religious foundations, right? Traditional religious views. If there are no absolutes, that will also include so-called transcendental uh, absolutes. And indeed, Hume, in his text, devotes some time and attention to that, uh, to that question. But you can therefore see the beginnings of the Humean project. Is there such a thing as an absolute moral code? Is there such a thing as absolute morality? From the point of view of Hume, the answer would be no, because everything is fundamentally contingent on the world of perception. And so in a meaningful sense, there is a correlation, or there's a connection between the Kantian enterprise in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals and Humean radical skepticism in the sense that we see Kant's efforts to try to describe a, me a moral metaphysics as a way to rescue this idea of morality from the uh, empirical contingency into which it has been placed by uh, David Hume. And ordinarily, we'd leave the question there, right? We simply say Hume sets up this challenge, Kant tries to, to answer it. But I think for the purposes of this class, and particularly the journey that we've traveled so far together, it's incumbent upon us also to consider an additional source, an additional, uh, an additional contributor to Kant's thinking, because I think it was also decisive, and it's another figure that we have read in this class, namely Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 
of the second discourse and of the social contract, who we've just been finishing uh, up considering. You may recall that in the second discourse, as part of Rousseau's radical reevaluation of the human experience and his, uh, his idiosyncratic and indeed, um, one might say, uh, extraordinary attempt to try and claim that what we perceive as human progress is in fact the reverse, and so on, all that stuff that we looked at. You may recall that, that, that Rousseau historicizes the idea of human reason. Human reason is something that as original man we do not need and it's only something then that we develop as a result of our experience coming out of nature. It's part of this, what he calls our perfectibilité, that we then actually need human reason. So we have this extraordinary historicization of human reason. But additionally, you may recall that not only does he historicize human reason, he also historicizes human morality. Uh, some of you mentioned it in your submitted written work, that for Rousseau, there is no need for morality until we start living with other people. Prior to living in communities, I don't need to know what is right or what is wrong. The expediencies that moral codes provide are unnecessary for people living in a kind of savage, isolated happiness. So another way of saying that is that morality for Rousseau is, like reason, a construct of civilization or that more, we need morality when we move into the state, so that the state creates morality. We need to be extremely careful with Rousseau to distinguish between what we might call a state morality, which is to say that the state, as it were, asserts a moral, uh, a moral authority, creates a moral code. That's not what Rousseau is saying. Rousseau is saying is that it's when we move into the state that we, for ourselves, uh, adduce a moral sense that we come up with for ourselves, the idea of morality. So like Hume, in Rousseau, we find the idea of morality being contingent. But unlike Hume, for Rousseau, it's, it's even more provocative because it suggests that human beings don't even need morality, that the only reason we have morality is because it's a necessary expedient for living inside of civil society. As long as I'm not living in civil society, I will not need this concept. And as you recall from Rousseau, he has this kind of what we might call argument from efficiency. Human beings don't waste time on things that are not necessary to them. So this notion that the morality that's around us is a function of the civil society in which we live, I think combined with, the, with Humean skepticism represents a very serious challenge. It makes us ask the basic question, is there, is there no absolute right and wrong? Is everything simply relational, contingent, circumstantial? Can we not reach for something higher, something more meaningful, something deeper, something better than that? That's the sort of state that we're left in uh, in, this, in this context. The power, I think, of Rousseau's idea is visible uh, indirectly, perhaps, to many of you who chose to write on the Wollstonecraft text. Because think about what Mary Wollstonecraft is saying. What is the morality of 18th century England, or 18th century English society in which she finds herself? It is a morality that says it is okay to deprive young girls of educational opportunities. It's a morality that says it's fine to emphasize women should expend effort on when they are young and discard the life that they will lead thereafter. It's a morality that essentially says it's all right to treat women as second-class citizens to, uh, to condemn them or at least to relegate them into this second-tier status and so on. In other words, Mary Wollstonecraft reads the problem of the female body in 18th century society not just as a problem of social custom, but also as a problem of moral attitude. And that then sort of, as it were, impinges upon the Rousseauian idea. States or the civil society creates the morality it wants. It's not immutable, it's not fundamental, it can be changed. The way you change it is you leverage your reason, you try and engage in arguments and so on. And I think most of us would agree that we tend to live still in a kind of Rousseauian moral construct, that the moral codes, what we think of as right or wrong, are changing all the time uh, around us as a result of the evolution of our thinking uh, and the like. So that sort of powerful notion that we get from Rousseau, I think, is still very much operative, even if we don't necessarily like to say it out loud.
Well, the third element that's obviously missing from this, but that you can see is, imp is implied in my remarks so far is, well, what about divine moral authority? Surely we have a source of moral code, moral law. God, him or her or itself, whichever your gender preference is, right? God can grant hu moral certainty to human beings. <clears throat> but by the end of the 18th century, that, as, and we've already seen, as it were, the disintegration of a reliance upon divine transcendental truth, starting with Hobbes, or even really starting with Machiavelli and moving forward. By the end of the 18th century, it is insufficient. In fact, it is, it is uh, inadequate to simply say, well, there is a transcendental fundamental morality that comes from God. Uh, for starters, there are lots of different gods, so does that mean there are lots of different moralities? And second of all, our understanding of what God is, right, our understanding, as it were, of, of religion and religious codes and the like, that if that's where our morality comes from, then it goes back to a kind of Humean skepticism. It seems to be brokered by empirical experience. We have to encounter the religion that we're going to follow until we can then encounter some kind of morality that goes with it. Whereas what Kant wants to do is argue for a deeper kind of morality. You don't need to read a book to know that killing another human being is wrong. It's not like, I don't know, JB is sitting there about to kill somebody. And you're like, wait, JB, hang on. I've just been reading this interesting book. It says you shouldn't kill. And he's like, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, look right here. Okay, I'll stop. That doesn't happen because we know fundamentally that it is wrong. And this is what Kant wants to investigate, this notion of what we might call absolute, in fact, what he calls pure morality. Morality that's outside of experience, outside of contingency, outside of circumstance, but a pure moral self, right? A pure moral sense of, of who we are. So this is what's driving Kant's uh, investigation. Are there any questions so far? Okay, you can see in the preface this agenda taking shape inside of this short Kantian work. He says, what "My question? yes." Sorry, but we cannot see this thing now. Oh, really? Okay, let me stop and try again. How's that? Yes, thank you. So you can see, he says, since my aim here is properly directed to moral philosophy, I limit the proposed question only to this. Whether one is not of the opinion that it is absolutely necessary to work out a pure moral philosophy, right? So a sense of morality that is in and of itself, which is fully cleansed, or we might say divorced from, everything that might be in any way empirical, meaning belonging to the world of the senses, or anthropological, belonging to man, right? Belonging to the experiences that, that people have with each other. So is there a way that we can think about morality, a moral philosophy, moral knowledge, right? That's what moral philosophy means, is our knowledge of what is moral outside of this world of experience, of, in, of empirical reality, outside of human interaction? Do I need to inter start interacting with people to figure out what is right or wrong? Do I need to start engaging with the world around me in order to work out where, what morality consists of? Or is there a way that we might know it uh, before that, at a, at a more, pure, at a, what he calls a pure level? And he says, there must be such a morality. He says that there is such a thing as pure morality is self-evident from what he calls the common idea of duty and of moral laws. You don't need to read a book to know that it is wrong to kill or hurt other people. You don't need to have been born in a certain country or in a certain time or place in order to know that causing suffering is bad. This is a universal understanding that this is not the kind of thing that we should be, we should be doing. Where does that come from? Why is it that someone who was born 5,000 years ago and someone who will be born 5,000 years from now, someone whose native language is Swahili and someone whose native language is Korean, someone whose 
religious background is Shinto and someone whose religious background is Buddhist, yet they can all agree on these basic moral laws. For Kant, that makes it self-evident that there is some underlying morality. Morality is not merely contingent. If it were, it would be much more varied than what we see. Instead, there is widespread agreement on the universality of what he calls the idea of duty and of moral laws. And he says, if it's going to be accepted as a law, we have to accept that for it to be valid morally, it carries an absolutely necessary obligation. It requires that we always observe it. It's not as if to say, well, sometimes it's right to kill people, but sometimes it isn't. These have to have a kind of universal, constant quality to them in order for them to gain character as, as laws. Hence, the ground of obligation. Where do we look for that sense of obligation or what we might call duty? And don't worry, we'll define our terms as we go forward is to be sought not in the nature of the human being or the circumstances of the world in which he is placed, but a priori solely in the concepts of pure reason. So another way of saying that is, when is it wrong to kill another human being? Well, when they're young, or when they have a lot to live for, or when they've been very nice to you, or when they are, could be helpful to you in the future. No, it's always wrong. There is not a circumstantial case to be made for when it's right or when it's wrong. It's not about where you happen to find yourself. This has to be a universal feature. It is always wrong to cause harm, to kill, suffer, make others suffer, etc. Right? That's what he's saying. Outside of circumstances. So in other words, non-contingent, non-anthropological. Not related to the nature of the human being or the circumstances of the world. But solely in the concepts of what? Of pure reason. Right? Solely in the concepts of pure reason. So here we see that enlightenment idea. Reason, again, taking this incredibly important role inside of this scheme that by virtue of our reason, we have, at least Kant will argue, access to the notion of a pure, uh, a pure moral philosophy. In other words, a pure knowledge of what morality is. He says, this is again from the preface when he's laying out his agenda for this brief work. He says, a metaphysics of morals, and by metaphysics, right, is that sort of study which is not uh, contingent on anything, pure knowledge in this sense, is indispensably necessary not merely from a motive of speculation in order to investigate the source of the practical principles lying beforehand in our reason, but also because morals themselves remain subject to all sorts of corruption as long as that guiding thread and what he calls supreme norm of their correct judgment is lacking. So there's a practical element to this, to this exercise. We need to understand or how to access a pure morality because if we don't, what we find is that our moral judgment is frequently corrupted or made impure or leads us to engage in things which might later on be proved to be erroneous. We might treat people who have a different religion or skin color than we have as if, they were not, as if their humanity were not equal to ours. We might treat people who have a different gender than we do as if somehow they don't belong or they don't deserve their full humanity. All of these would be moral compromises from within a Kantian scheme. How do we learn to do better? How do we learn to recognize a kind of universal humanity that's guided by a universal morality? Well, we have to make the moral code upon which we base our behavior not contingent, not circumstantial, not anthropological, but instead absolute. We need, need to make sure that the actions that we do not just conform to moral law, but that our actions are because they are moral law, for the sake of moral law. That is, true moral action is done not for the outcome, but because it is a moral action. That's the sort of uh, commandment that, um, that Kant wants us to get our heads around. And we'll see that this idea of it is not enough that action, or that for an action to be morally good, that it conform to the moral law, but that for an action to be morally good, it must also happen for the sake of this law. That, for, for Kant, is a critical uh, distinction, and we'll see the importance of that as we, as we go forward. And so you'll see that at the end of the preface, he says the present groundwork, this idea of the Grundlage, preparing the foundations for a, for a larger metaphysics of morality, that the present effort is nothing more than the search for an establishment of the supreme principle of morality. So no pressure, 
right? It's a modest goal. All we're going to be looking for here is the supreme principle of morality, which already constitutes an enterprise whole in its aim. So this is what he wants us to get. Is there a way that we can find out where, how, what supreme morality uh, is? And so after the preface and the bulk of his remarks, he divides his comments or he divides his considerations into three sections. And each section he labels as what we translate into English as a transition. And that idea of a transition, I think, is interesting, right? To transition means to move from one state into another state, or to move from one place into another place. And I think by labeling the sections of his essay transitions from common rational knowledge or popular moral philosophy and so on, that what he's essentially signaling is that the moral environment in which we presently live is inadequate to any moral uh, aspiration that is premised on purity or absolute moral knowledge. So therefore, it creates a kind of an agenda for for humanity, for human beings. We need to transition. We need to move away from the circumstantial, contingent, civil, social, moral understandings that we have at the moment and instead aspire to reach for something greater, right? Something that is more absolute. And you'll see his three transitions. The first from what we might call, what he calls common rational knowledge, but we would call common sense, right? To a philosophical knowledge of morality, to a knowledge of morality that's based on knowing. So common sense would be a sense of like a contingent judgment as opposed to a kind of more absolute knowledge. From popular moral philosophy to metaphysical morality. So, in other words, instead of just thinking about, well, you know, it's good, not to, it's good to treat your brothers or your, your family nice, etc., whatever it might be, instead to, have, um, to be able to lay more fundamental claims to moral action. And finally, in the third part, this idea of a metaphysics of morality to a critique of pure practical reason, this does a lot of work. It's the shortest section of all, but it does a lot of work inside of Kant's scheme. As I read it, it links Kant's entire uh, agenda here back to the challenges laid out by Rousseau because in part three Kant essentially restores a vision of human freedom or autonomy but built around the concept of morality which I see is very consistent with the sort of Rousseauian framing of this exercise because you recall that for Rousseau the whole point of the social contract is to grant to people the liberty that otherwise will be lost to them. So I see that there's a sympathy there. Anyway, as I mentioned before, part three is, I think, takes us more into pure philosophy than it does political philosophy. So I'll make a couple of remarks about that transition uh, at the end, but I won't bother getting into it textually. But it's important to note that for, for number three, the transition that, he, that Kant sees here is actually a transition into freedom, right? a transition to liberty that otherwise we can never have unless we can live according to, pure moral, uh, according to a pure moral philosophical knowledge of ourselves. Uh, yes, Elena, question. Um, okay, everyone has morals, but the thing is, when, when it comes to the point of mental health issues, like when people say, like, that's a mental health issue, like, killing for me is something that they, not me, like, a pe- that person that says, like, killing another person is right for me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. So Kant has an easy answer for that. Morality is linked to reason. So if you have psychopathological tendencies... Uh, what it means is that your, that your human reason is flawed, right? For, I think for Kant, that's pretty straightforward. Now, we might argue that based on modern medical science, but if for some reason you, Elena, think, you know, I think it's, you know, it's a perfectly acceptable moral choice to be going around killing people all day, and I've got 16 bodies already in my basement, it's just a personal choice. I think Kant would argue that, you suffer, that your, your reason is flawed, right? That you don't have a functioning, a functioning reason. After all, animals kill things all the time, right? Um, and we don't ascribe to them uh, blame, we just say that they live non-rationally, right? And we'll come to that, actually, that idea in a moment. Are there any other questions? Okay, let's continue. So all this to say, three transitions, right? Common sense, popular ideas of morality into this abstract, uh, deeper understanding that, 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 uh, that Kant wants. And then finally, this transition to a, a new reading of the autonomous self, which we'll deal with briefly at the end. So part one begins with uh, this question of, so the transition from common sense 
to philosophical moral cognition. He says, um, there is nothing it is possible to think of anywhere in the world, or indeed anything at all outside, that can be held to be good without limitation, excepting only a good will. <laughs> That's a complex, I mean, this is the way he begins the discussion. And you're already, you're like, what the fuck is that? So this idea of like, what is unlimited good? It is impossible to think of anything anywhere in the world or anything outside of it at all that can be held to be good without limitation, except only a good will. Um, which raises the question, what's, what does he mean by this? What's a good, a good will? So let's go to the basics. So will, right, volition, is our capacity for action. So when he says that we have the potential, or there's this idea for a, a good without limitation, and there's no boundaries to what is good, what he's saying is that the only place that we can conceive that without there's any limitation whatsoever is simply in what we might call intentionality. We can imagine an intentionality that is good without any kind of limit that is placed upon it. it may not always be the case, but we can at least conceive of that, that idea of good without limits at the level of the will, right? So our capacity, it's not how we act, but it's our willingness, right? Willing to act, the will to action, that we can understand as what he calls as a good, a good will where a good is without, um, without limitation. So it raises the question, okay, well, what is this good will? What does that mean then? And he says, he's at pains and following up discussion to note that we can't look at external characteristics of the self and somehow map it onto will. As he says here, moderation in, in affects and passions, meaning in our desires, self-control, sober reflection, etc. They may be good, they may be helpful, they may be part of being a good person, but they don't necessarily tell you that, that you have this, what he calls this good, uh, this good will. Because although they may be important characteristics, it's important to be self-controlled and to reflect soberly and be moderate and so on, in and of themselves, they don't necessarily lead to moral outcomes, right? You can't look at these characteristics. Another way of thinking about this is that we don't want to link moral outcomes with the character or the personality of the moral actor, right? We don't want to make it contingent in that way. We want to, we want to aspire to something else. So where is the morality of the self coming from? It's not coming from the fact that you're like a good person or that you are moderate in your habits or that you have respect for other people. Your morality, your capacity to act in a moral way is coming from the will that you have to act and that alone. Everything else is simply another manifestation of something else. But in terms of whether you can act morally or not, all of that has to come back, from, come back to the question of how you act, what decides the action you take and that's going to be the question of will, right? So in other words, you can have all these characteristics, but without the principles of goodwill, they can become extremely evil, right? Well known, for example, that uh, Hitler was a teetotaling vegetarian who was highly moderate in his habits, and yet a very evil person. So we can't mistake these external characteristic personality traits, etc., for being somehow linked to people's morality. It's only what drives action, and that's going to be the nature of will, your intention to act. He says, the good will is good not through what it affects or accomplishes. And this is going to confuse a lot of us uh, here at the beginning. The good will is not good through what it affects or accomplishes, not through its efficacy for attaining any attended end, but only through its willing, i.e. it is good in itself and considered for itself. Without comparison, it is to be estimated far higher than anything can be brought about by it, etc. And you'll see here that because as something that has full worth in itself, I'm referring to the line of bolded here at the bottom, utility or fruitlessness can neither add to nor subtract to anything from this worth. Okay, this, let's think about the implications of this. The idea of a good will being good in and of itself regardless of the outcome that it creates. Right? That's what essentially he's saying. So whether it creates a, an outcome or it doesn't has no bearing whatsoever on whether the will can be considered good because the notion of will is at this point simply in its, in its willingness, right? in the action that it wills to take place, not in the consequences of that action. The implication of this, of course, is extraordinary because it then separates or divorces absolutely, 
the notion of the will to act from any potential outcome or consequence. And because it's therefore completely divorced, it means that you never need to consider, you should not consider, it is amoral to consider the outcome or the consequence in terms of assessing the good will, right? That your will be good. What makes a good will? A, good, a will that is good is a will that's going to act according to this kind of fundamental moral precepts, which in this decontingent way means, remember, they always have to apply at all times. We've already heard this as, as, uh, already from Kant, and he'll explore that a little bit more. Okay, so just keep this in mind. We're going to explore it a little bit more, but that the will is, is it's only through its willing that it is good. It has nothing to do with the outcome or the consequence or lack thereof that it, uh, that it creates. <clears throat> he says, there is something so strange in this idea of the absolute worth of the mere will without making any advance allowance for utility in its estimation that despite all the agreement with it, even of common reason, there must have nevertheless arise a suspicion that perhaps it is covertly grounded merely on a high-flown fantasy and that nature might have falsely understood in the aim it had in assigning reason to govern our will. Again, another classic Kantian phrase. I'm not exactly sure what this means, but here's my best guess for what this, uh, for what this means. He says, something so strange in this idea of the absolute worth of the mere will. Okay, so let's consider what, may, what might make it strange. Here's the famous example that uh, professors of ethical philosophy always give in conjunction with teaching this text. You are living in Amsterdam, 1941, and you have Anne Frank and her family hiding up in your attic, right? Because they're being persecuted, and so therefore they've taken refuge in your attic. It is amoral to lie. You should never tell a lie. Kant himself specifically tells us that lying is part of this universal moral code. There, on Tuesday morning, knock at the door. It's the Gestapo. Are you harboring any known people in your house? Are you harboring anyone uh, of interest to us in your house? And you know that if you tell them the truth, that they will go up, round up Anne Frank and her family, and send them off to certain death. What should you do? And for Kant, there is no ambiguity whatsoever in terms of what you should do. It is always amoral to lie. Therefore, you are bound as a moral actor for the will to be good, it will tell the truth. The willing of truth is what makes it good. Therefore, you answer, yes, I have Anne Frank and her family in the attic of my house. Next thing you know, they're being let out in chains, sent off to the death camps, and they don't survive the war. Have you committed an amoral act by your commitment to telling the truth? And for Kant, the answer is no, you have not. If you had said, no, there's no one in my house, and saved them, for Kant, you would be committing an amoral act. This is the extreme inconvenience, we might call, of the Kantian scheme. When you divorce the good in and of itself from the will, with any potential outcome that might happen, you can imagine a thousand and one scenarios which immediately provoke all kinds of crazy questions in your head. Like, you're like, that can't be right. Wait, he doesn't really mean that. But that is what he means. Note what he says. Something so strange in this idea of the absolute worth of mere will that is just the nature of your will without making any allowance for utility, what might happen as a consequence that despite all agreement with it, even of common reason, there must nevertheless arise a suspicion that perhaps it is covertly grounded merely on high-flown fantasy. Another way we would say that is, what have you been smoking, Immanuel Kant, for you to have come up with this? That's essentially what he's saying. It's like, ah, that can't be right, right? So this is the question. And if this is the case, nature has been falsely understood in the aim it had in assigning reason to govern our will. There you are as a rational person. You've answered the door to the Gestapo. You know that you're harboring Anne Frank and her family up there. Your reason should tell you you do not want to put them in unnecessary danger. After all, why would you be harboring them in the first place? And yet, it is your reason which governs your will. The reason your will is good is because it is governed by reason. So maybe nature made a mistake in doing this because now it's put us into this impossible paradox and this impossible position, right? Yes. Francisco. Sir, uh, so I had a question like regarding to Kant's always saying that um, you shouldn't 
like tell the truth and otherwise it's immoral. So do you do you say would you say that in general Kant doesn't think about consequences and doesn't really uh, force like beat him, beat him beat himself up about them? Yep, that's exactly what he's saying. That's what we saw here, right? That it's without making any allowance for utility, whether it produces happiness or not, right? Or we put back here, right? It's good in and of itself. Utility or fruitlessness has no bearing whatsoever on the nature of the goodwill. So it's very strange to us. Don't get me wrong. Yes, very, very bizarre, right? And you're like, that cannot be right. And Kant knows that it's strange because he too can imagine a thousand and one scenarios where you would think telling a lie would be the right thing to do or perhaps uh, dissembling or cheating or something like this. That there are many instances where we can think of contingency requiring actions which in an absolute sense might be deemed immoral, but which are made moral by circumstances. And that's what Kant wants to stress. There's no such thing as making, moral, making something moral by circumstance. Morality lies beyond circumstance. If it were simply something made moral by circumstance, we haven't advanced the agenda at all. We're back where Hume put us. Well, therefore, our morality depends on the experiences that we have. And so we might as well be back in this corner of contingence and empirical morality. And what does Kant want to tell us? No. Humanity wants to aspire to greater than that. There's absolute morality out there. We need to find it. And in order for that to happen, we therefore need to divorce morality from any empirical or circumstantial conditionality that we might then want to connect it to. So here is this question then, has nature screwed up by allowing our will to be governed by reason when it's your reason right now that's imagining, well, this can't be right. I can think of 16 scenarios off the top of my head which make this seem crazy, right? That's your reason doing that to you. So is this nature's mistake granting you a reason that makes the capacity to exercise a pure good will uh, impossible? And that's what he's asking here. And he says, well, why do we have reason? And it's not that we have reason in order for us to simply survive. Self-preservation is not a function of reason. He says, for that, nature has granted us instinct. Instinct is what allows animals or beings, entities to survive. Reason is doing different work for us, right? So this notion of reason is, uh, is achieving or looking to achieve a different, a different goal inside of man, right? He says, nature would have hit on a very bad arrangement in appointing reason in human beings to accomplish the aim merely of survival. So you can see there's this distinction then between instinct and reason. Instinct, which links to the survival principle, reason is there for something else. So let's take a look at, uh, at how this kind of goes. And it's a bit complex, and in a moment I'll, you'll see I've sketched it out for you. Um, but here's essentially what he, how he understands it, right? He says, the will may therefore not be the single and entire good, but will is the highest good. Right? The highest good. What does that mean? It means that goodness, in its most absolute form, always starts with this in the willing of action. Not the action itself, but the willing of action before any kind of outcome or contingent, uh, contingency can be observed. Uh, and the condition for all rest, even for every demand for happiness, in which case it can be united with the wisdom of nature. When one perceives that the culture of reason, which is required for will, right, the highest good, limits, in many ways, the attainments of happiness. Again, another very classic Kantian statement. So another way of saying this is that the exercise of our reason appears often to make us less happy than if we didn't have reason, right? If we could simply act on instinct, do whatever we wanted, well, therefore, maybe it would, would seem like we would be happier than if we are, our, our actions are bounded by reason, because reason is affecting our will. What should I do, not what would I like to do? The distinction we might draw here that, ha that Kant is hinting at is one we've already seen as being foundational in the work of John Locke, who recall in his chapter on the state of nature said, yet man has liberty or yet man be in a state of liberty, it is not a state of license. And we've, uh, we've translated that into the notion of free to do what you should, not free to do what you want. And that distinction between a freedom or autonomy that's around what you should do versus an autonomy around what you'd like to do links to this division between reason and instinct that we see in Kant. And Kant will further refine that notion of what we should do in just a moment. He says, note here, we need that the, that the concept of a goodwill 
dwells already, I'm at the second paragraph, dwells already in the naturally healthy understanding, which does not need to be taught, but rather only, and note the word he uses, only to be enlightened. So here we're linking back then to the sort of Kantian idea of uh, what is enlightenment. Enlightenment is a process of maturity, a, a, a process of acquisition of, under, of skill to use what we've been granted, namely our reason. But the important thing here, right, is it does not need to be taught. For Hume, nature teaches. That's where we learn the things that we, that we have, is we learn from nature through our empirical relationship. What Kant is saying is that the nature of goodwill or that the, that the goodwill that we have governed by reason is not something that needs to be taught. It's there in all of us by virtue of the fact that we have reason to, be, to begin with, right? And how does it make manifest? As we've seen already in the preface, the reason that, we, that Kant feels comfortable or confident in making this assertion that there is something called a universal goodness to will is the fact that the world over, outside of time and place, uh, regardless of custom or religion, etc., that people have the same concept of what he calls duty. And that's this notion of doing what you should, not doing what you want. Any action to preserve yourself is instinctual. Actions that are guided by the sense of what you should do, those are rational. So there's this link then between duty, uh, the goodwill, reason, and nature. And I think I've sketched it out. Yes, here we go. So if we take a moment, and we'll take a break in just a second. If we take a moment here, here's where we are so far. Kant wants us to think that there is such a thing as pure morality. That pure morality is not transcendental or divine. God does not grant us pure morality as a gift of our existence. Instead, it needs to come from a pure sense of knowledge, right? Pure moral philosophy, a knowledge of what is moral. Where does it come from? And we can see so far that we've put into a couple of, uh, a couple of things. We see that nature endows people with this potential for will, for willing an action. Uh, as opposed to mere instinct, which is the kinds of reflexive or non-reflective non actions that we take in order to survive. Will is guided by reason, so therefore we put reason before will, right? Will is shaped by the reason that we, that we all have. The will that we strive for is esteemed in itself, right? Good actions at the level of, uh, sorry, not good actions because of what they produce, but good actions because of the nature of the willing of the action is itself good. And so we've kind of created this. Nature, reason, goodwill, and then duty, where duty is the manifestation of a goodwill shaped by reason, which comes from nature, right? That's the sketch so far that we've seen sort of Kant tracing out in this, in this work. Okay. Let me finish with three principles. We'll take a break, and we'll come back and look at, at part two in the categorical imperative, and then we can open up the floor to some discussions and like, is Kant even serious and this can't really be true, etc. So uh, once we have the idea of duty in place, duty being the action that has, action that has moral worth, let's define it that way. Duty means action that has moral worth. He says there are three things, three principles that define, uh, that define duty or they, that duty must be guided by these three principles. The first example that he gives has always made me laugh a little bit because <laughs> It's this notion of, and he doesn't, he doesn't specify it as such in the text. He gives a very curious example. He says, most people, he says, everybody keeps themselves alive out of, you know, as duty. So in other words, the fact that you had breakfast, or you drink water, or I'm drinking tea, it's just I do it as a sense of duty to, to my desire to stay alive, right? He says that is not, that has no moral worth, right? The fact that you, you eat breakfast or drink water to stay alive. On the other hand, Take someone who's abjectly miserable and hates everything about their life, and yet day to day continues to continues to to exist, right? Because they feel they have a duty to life. This is moral, right? You shall not cause the harm, the, the harm that, or, or cause suffering to the life of, of anyone, including yourself. So you have a moral obligation, right, to protect life. So therefore, you, even though you hate your life, it's miserable. You're stuck in like political theory classes and you can't imagine what's going on and you're wondering about all these life choices you've made. Yet, when you wake up in the morning, you pledge to commit to living another day. Kant salutes you for your commitment to your own misery because that, he says, is an example of doing something 
what he calls from duty. It is my duty, he says, uh, wishes for death and yet preserves his life without loving it, not from inclination nor fear, but from duty. This gives moral worth to an action. An action to have moral value, to be a duty, in other words, it must be done from duty, right? It must be done from the sense of, of duty. So that's the first principle. The second principle, he says, the second proposition is an action from duty has its moral worth not in the aim that it is supposed to be attained by it, but rather in the maxim in accordance with which it is resolved upon. So, to go back to my example, uh, it's not the consequence of the will, it is the maxim that then decides what the will should do, what duty is. So the maxim in this case, right, meaning, well, we'll see what maxim means in a moment, but maxim would be like, it is always wrong to lie. It is always wrong to cause harm or suffering to another. It is, it is always wrong to, say, deprive people of the freedom of their beliefs, something like this, right? And there is never, there is never a circumstance where that maxim is challenged or changed. It is universal and applies at all times. And so the point about it is an action, a duty has moral worth, not from the outcome that it creates, but the principle, the maxim upon which it is based, right? So if I commit to tell the truth, therefore my duty is to tell the truth, that has moral worth. If I say, well, I only tell the truth sometimes, that has no moral worth. So the moral value of action is not in the consequence or goal, but in the maxim that drives it. And we'll see he defines maxim in the third principle. He tells us in a, in a footnote, a maxim is the subjective principle of the, of the will. So in other words, this is the way that we individually translate our sense, of moral, our, our sense of moral duty into principles. It is wrong to kill. It is wrong to lie. It is wrong to, to cheat or these kinds of things, right? That's, that's the maxim. The third proposition, as a consequence of the first two, I would express thus, duty is the necessity of an action from respect for the law. This is by far and away the most important of the three principles, and this is what's going to give us this discussion, its important political, philosophical edge. Duty is the necessity of an action for respect for the law. Now, an action from duty is supposed entirely to abstract from the influence of desire and with it every object of the will. So nothing is left over for the will that can determine it except the law as what is objective and subjectively pure respect for this practical law. Hence the maxim of complying with such a law even when it infringes all my implications. My desire is not to betray the person hiding in my attic that, that she and her family get taken away to certain death. That is my desire. And yet I know that the law that I must respect is it is always wrong to lie. Therefore, despite the fact that my desire is to save the person's life living in my attic by doing something immoral, nonetheless, I must conform my will to law. The law being, in this case, this principle that that shall not lie. But you'll see, he says, uh, the necessity of an action from respect for the law, which raises this basic question, what is the law? Right? Where is the law coming from? We don't have divine law. We've gotten rid of that, so it's not some transcendental divine legal authority. It can't be the law, as we think of it as meaning, for example, adjudicatory institutions of the state creating laws for us on an ongoing ad hoc circumstantial or contingent basis. In order for this third principle to make sense, this notion of law has to start doing some pretty heavy lifting because it has to refer to something that's going to have universal, a universal characteristic, a universal uh, facet to it. And that's then what we get in the second, in the second part, is this question of, of law, right? So from nature, which creates reason, which shapes goodwill, which translates into duty, which is always respect for the law, what is law? And then we'll, so this is the question we'll come back to uh, in our, after our break. Okay, so let me take, uh, let's take 10 minutes, come back at 11.30. Is that enough time for people to go get coffees and teas and whatever other things they need to go get? So we'll come back at 11.30 and uh, we'll finish up with, the, with part two of the groundwork of the metaphysics. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you guys in now nine minutes.